Welcome to Little Breaks Virtual Book Tour. Today we're talking to Micah Namrever, author of These Violent Delights. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us what your awesome book is about? Um, it's sort of a, um, a toxic love story or something like it. Um, it's it, it, it gets billed as crime fiction sometimes, but I, I think of it as sort of um, a book about feelings that has murder in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, um, it's about two teenagers who, who fall in, in love in a way that sort of consumes their identity and, and they get really wrapped up in each other and um, bring out the worst in each other, even as they have this really profound connection. So it's, it's it's a complicated love story and sort of a, an exploration of uh, moral struggles and um, sort of the the disillusionment of um, of the twentieth century. So it's yeah, for sure. I love your writing so much. It's Thank so you. beautiful. People call it a combination between a secret history and call me by your name i've never read either but i trust them but i liked <laughs> it just the way it is it's so cool Thank um, you. and it takes place in the 70s um, yeah. while these two are going to college yeah. um, and i guess right off the bat you know paul is he's such an amazing character and we kind of see it most of it through his eyes and not all of it and I, yeah. this kind of occurred to me right before we got on. Um, Paul is going through a huge amount of grief because he just lost his dad. And yeah. Julian is kind of, he's so, they're both so smart, but Julian is, he's interested in how pain works in others. And yeah. so I guess I was wondering, did you feel that grief made Paul susceptible to Julian? Or do you think that his sort of built up anger would have just found an avenue? anyway um I think I think the the place he's in of like really extreme emotional vulnerability definitely makes him a lot more um a lot more volatile um he's um yeah he his his anger kind of has increased because he um because he's experienced this this loss and disillusionment um in in his father's death that that um, has kind of allowed his anger to come to the forefront. And um, part of the issue is like, he's he's really internalized a lot of um, sort sort of the the narrative of of maleness mm -hmm. that um, the the emotion you are allowed to experience above all is anger. And so he he's sublimating a lot of his grief into anger, and he can kind of. Um, he kind of vectors both of these through his relationship with Julian. I love that um, they both had so much agency in this toxic relationship. <laughs> like nobody, I mean, to me, it didn't feel like anybody, I say susceptible, but nobody was like a victim to someone else. They kind of yeah. both fueled each other. Um, and like the idea of toxic masculinity is kind of an interesting one for this book because like neither of them are conventionally masculine and they go against heteronormativity, I get that word wrong all the time, heteronormativity in themselves in all these different ways. But like you said, anger is how they, you know, choose to express themselves. So I guess, why did you want to explore how queerness and romantic obsession and masculinity kind of intersect in this way? Um, it it was uh, when I was doing research for this book. Um, I noticed that a lot of the um, a lot of the depictions of obsessive same gender romantic friendships are are sort of vectored through femininity. Like they, they tend to center on female characters and sort of how how teenage girls kind of feed off each other's um, insecurities and stuff and and I, I was really interested in um, I I'm trans but I do identify as male and so my experience of these kinds of friendships as a teenager was different mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really interesting to be in dialogue with these books but I uh, definitely the um, masculinity wears its anger closer to the surface 
and um and romantic love um whether consummated or not when you're at this really vulnerable stage in your life it um it's a form of vulnerability that i think um can be terrifying and frustrating in in a way that is hard to reckon with directly uh for anybody um but especially if you've got some kind of hangups about uh, being vulnerable, which in their own ways, both Paul and Julian do uh, for different reasons, um, anger is safer. Anger makes you feel like you have some agency and you're not like helpless in the face of your vulnerability. And, yeah. and it definitely fuels um, the kind of toxicity between them because they, they both feel very, um, very vulnerable to each other and neither of them wants to mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's an interesting um tension that i wanted to explore and um i also wanted to explore this kind of story as overtly queer mm -hmm. um because i haven't seen that as much either yeah it's their their relationship felt so real i think a lot of us have had that one you know that relationship where it becomes volatile and so like when you see stories like this where it really pushes past the limit you're like well i could see in a way how things could get that far obviously this yeah. is an extreme version but yeah, yeah. it's super unfortunately relatable or fortunately <laughs> i don't know but um did you i'm always interested like how did you find because i i read somewhere that you partially wrote this book to kind of unpack some of that teenage anger. I don't know why we're talking about anger so much, but personally, I weirdly like dissecting reasons for anger. Yeah. So we're going to keep going. Um, <laughs> but what was it like trying to put personal experiences into plot or kind of seeing where personal experiences can fit into plot? If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it, um, some of it was drawn from, I did have, um, but much less destructive, but mm -hmm. still interpersonally toxic uh, relationships when I was a teenager. Um, especially, I think, queer relationships and uh, same gender relationships, there's an aspirational quality that mm -hmm. I don't like, like, you, you can have the same level of obsession in in a relationship between a boy and a girl but like um you don't meet a lot of boys who want to be their girlfriend mm -hmm. um and so so it's 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 interesting in terms of like the way it really subsumes your identity and you're you're kind of aspiring to something what in your relationship with mm -hmm. this person and and that vulnerability it opens you up to um toxicity if if the other person brings out the worst in you but also it the fact that it brings out the worst in you sometimes means that it brings out the worst in them too mm -hmm. and so um yeah i think a lot of people have regrets about the jerk things they did when they were 17 <laughs> but it's um yeah it, so so that's I was drawing some from that, um, not just from the experience of it as a form of suffering, but also kind of exploring my own culpability. Mm -hmm. um, like you mentioned, the power dynamic between Paul and Julian is a lot more complicated. It's not a matter of like um, Julian being this like charming mm -hmm. sociopath or something who leads Paul astray. Like they, they feed off each other in a way where they're both very actively engaged with each other's worst qualities and their own worst qualities. And um, so a thing I was kind of grappling with was the, the capacity for cruelty and jealousy mm -hmm. that I found in myself when I was a teenager and have since worked really hard to overcome. But it... Um, <laughs> But it definitely like, um, and especially in the context of um, of being an adolescent in the late '90s and early mm -hmm. aughts, um, I mentioned this in the author's note. Like that was the the era of Columbine, mm -hmm. and so so there was this really pervasive cultural narrative when I was a young angry teenager that teenage anger and alienation and feeling bullied or persecuted. Um, could lead you to become a monster. Mm -hmm. And so in general, as an angry teenager, and especially in these relationships that that were sort of toxic, like like um, 
both my anger and my vulnerability felt like they could push me to a kind of monstrosity that I, I realize in retrospect I'm not capable mm-hmm. of but but at the time it felt very close to the surface and mm-hmm. very close to something I could be capable of um and I didn't want to be I was afraid of that possibility and so so sort of the um the toxicity spiraling into into a drive for violence mm-hmm. um was it's sort of like the worst case scenario of of mm-hmm what adolescence can be and what that kind of relationship can be. And so I was sort of taking, I was looking back at the fears I had about myself and sort of just flinging them out onto the page and um, exercising them. Um, yeah, that's actually, it's actually super helpful to hear you put it that way. Cause I think, yeah, you, I think sometimes when people are writing, they're like, is this too far or is this too weird? But I think that's a yeah. good it is like what's your fears look at those and then what's the worst case scenario yeah for that um which is interesting and yeah that that attraction that you talked about totally came across where Paul was attracted to Julian but he was also wanting to be Julian as much as wanting him it definitely came across and I'm sure that feeling is like I don't even know how you captured that but well well done (laughs) um Another interesting part of the book is um, the Holocaust casts a long shadow over the book because Paul, you know, his father was, um, he has, his father experienced a lot of trauma as a refugee. And even though Paul is being educated in America, he kind of has this interesting perspective when he sees, because they're studying behavioral sciences, right? Or social Uh sciences. Yeah, um, they they meet in a scientific ethics class, and Julian mm-hmm. is is a social psychology major. So so Paul picks up on a fair bit of that too, for sure. And and Paul has that interesting perspective, like when they mention the Tuskegee experiment, this like moral outrage because he can see how that could lead to what his father went through, the horrible things yeah. that he went through. Can you talk about why you wanted to explore the friction? I guess between those two identities they have so many layers to them but yeah it's it um I chose the the time and setting of the book very deliberately to to be like one generation removed from the holocaust Mm -hmm. because it's um so much of Paul's anger is stemmed in or stems from like legitimate moral outrage Mm -hmm. and um fear um that he is again processing his outrage um that uh it's sort of this uneasy tension between this this sort of myth of america as safe Mm -hmm. and different from from other parts of the world and just his, his knowledge that a lot of this stems from human nature mm-hmm and some of that came from my own academic background. Like I, um, I wrote my master's thesis on uh, art in the Weimar Republic. And I always tell people the scariest thing I learned doing that degree is that there was nothing special about Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just, um, their human nature and certain neuroses pervasive in Western countries make society's vulnerable Mm -hmm. and Paul is definitely in a position to understand that and he sort of engages with this really relentlessly um partly because he's trying to process um how to integrate this generational trauma into his Mm -hmm. identity um so yeah a lot of his motives are really rooted in um in this trauma and Mm -hmm. how he's trying to process it and turn it into like um, a sweeping statement or or understanding of humanity and human nature for sure yeah that they all that's what I love so much about your book is the setting and the historical context and then the family grief and his relationship with Julian it all felt so seamless and like it was just all sort of feeding each other and all these similar feelings but all these different ways I love that when I was researching you you cited Shirley Jackson's hangs a man as an influence for the book particularly in revisions 
Can you talk about how her writing inspired you? Oh gosh, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I I try to make everybody I know read this book. I love it to bits. Uh, possibly my favorite book. Um, it's um, it's it's a very different kind of story, but it it um it has a couple elements in common with these violent delights that um. I, I read it fairly late in writing the first draft and I just it just really resonated with me in a similar on a similar emotional level to to TVD um, while being a very different kind of book. And so um, one of the one of the factors is that the protagonist Natalie is both like deeply traumatized and just incredibly um, profoundly depressed, uh, mm -hmm. partly because of this trauma and partly because of loneliness. And um, she also has a lot of really interesting um, sort of violent or transgressive fantasies that she sort of escapes into to deal with this loneliness and trauma. And so it's, um, I, I felt like um, she had some commonality with Paul uh, psychologically um, in, in a much more internalized way, um, which which could be partly about gender socialization um, and partly just um, because it is a very different kind of book. But mm -hmm. it, I thought it was a really fascinating exploration of trauma mm -hmm. and and like incredible alienation, um, especially in late adolescence. Um, you know, tr trying to find your identity um, when you first get to college and it just doesn't work. <laughs> um, so that was one factor. And then the other is there, um, there is a, there is, especially toward the end of the book, a really intense uh, codependent friendship that Natalie forms with another mm -hmm. girl um, who sort of embodies um, everything Natalie is afraid to be herself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, it, it's it's handled in a very different way, but I really liked the they have this rapport with each other that it's like their their conversation flows um, in, in a way where where they they seem like they're kind of one step ahead of each other mm -hmm. going going in both directions, and it's just like this really easy banter um, and and sort of care for each other that it really. It, it makes you understand what Natalie, especially in her really vulnerable state, finds so intoxicating about this mm -hmm. relationship. And um, so it just, it really resonated with me. And I, um, one of the things I, that influenced me was like, it, it, um, it, it kind of clarified a little of Paul's psychology for me. Mm -hmm. And also it's got this, this sort of, um, fever dreamy quality that I, I, I yearn to imitate. Um, yeah, just Shirley Jackson. I love her. Um, <laughs> I, I literally have it on my bedside table for the to be read. And so I just read your book and I loved it. So when you said, when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I bet I'm going to love this too. It's so, so good. I I'm excited. It. I'm excited. <laughs> It'll be my first Shirley Jackson, which is horrible. I feel like that it's taken me this long, but oh, it, wherever you can start yeah. is is it's the right good. place <laughs> i'm glad that you brought up that that her dialogue helped you a little because your dialogue is so amazing and i think i was trying to kind of synthesize why i loved it so much and i think it's because of what you just said that your dialogue shows because sometimes julian's a step ahead of him or they're a step ahead of each other what is so intoxicating about that relationship that dialogue yeah. can not only be information, but showing a dynamic, which yeah. I logged the hardest thing ever. So yours was really <laughs> inspiring. Oh, thank you. Did you, how, I guess I'm just gonna ask, how do you approach dialogue? Do you map out what you want from a scene or? Um, I, I go into scenes knowing roughly where I want them to go. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, I really like um, sort of the psychological interplay between characters. Uh, dialogue for me is as much about what they're not saying as what they're saying. So I, I really like um, sort of planning out what they're eliding mm -hmm. and what they're really saying to each other when they say something else. For sure. And so it's, 
it definitely it's rooted in the psychological dynamic and how I want a specific scene to advance the dynamic between characters and um and so it it starts from the aim of the scene and and the meaning that I'm going for and and then um, evolves into specific dialogue after that um and I just like I try to have an understanding of of the the different ways different characters are going to express themselves like mm -hmm. the the quirks of their vocabulary the things they have trouble articulating versus the things that they are just like really on the ball with and um I my thing with dialogue is I don't necessarily think it needs to be illusionistic like I I think it you can stylize it and it can still feel natural within the story without sounding exactly like something someone would say out loud. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I hope to achieve that, but it's definitely true of a lot of the books I, I admire um, that it's, it, it feels true rather mm -hmm. than sounding true. Mm -hmm. So. For sure. Yeah, I loved your dialogue. And I totally <laughs> felt it when Paul was like, um, I'm feeling really inadequate right now. Like he's kind of <laughs> punishing me, but at least I'm worthy of someone he wants to punish. I was like, I don't think this is healthy, but I am feeling what you're saying right now. <laughs> uh, so, so it's, it's so, they're both so rich and their psychology is so full. So it's, it's great. Um, and also you're an avid fan of queer cinema. I think your bio says you're an amateur historian, which yeah. is probably you being modest. Um, <laughs> if you were going to pair a film with your book, what would you choose if you happen to know any? Um, I One of the films I took a lot of inspiration from uh, with regard to the emotional dynamic between the characters in particular was uh, Heavenly Creatures. It's mm -hmm. one of the... Uh, Peter Jackson's early films is, is just stunning. Again, it's it's about a um, a relationship between two teenage girls, but there's a lot of overlap in that it's um it's about them both this really intense, sincere love they have for each other and the fact that this brings out in them this this desire to to do this this terrible act of violence. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a really interesting film um, that it it would function as a companion piece too. What gaps in queer fiction or representation do you still want to explore? Your book has so many that you explore, but anything else? Um, the a thing that I feel really strongly about is that queer characters should be able to have moral struggles mm -hmm. and um, and. I, I know there there's a lot of discourse uh, with a capital D around around um, like positive representation, mm -hmm. and for me, I'm much more interested in empathetic representation. And I feel like um, like uh, grappling with morality and sometimes failing, and there being at the very least the risk of failing, mm -hmm. is just it's really rich ground for drama mm -hmm. that I I want to. I want that to be accessible to queer characters as well as straight characters. Um, is yeah, I guess especially I just I love stories where it kind of feels like your soul is at stake. Mm -hmm. um, and in in some upcoming projects, I'm sort of touching on some similar ground to TVD in terms of like. Um, insecurity and pride and deep personality flaws and like dealing with existential terror um i i like <laughs> <Put it> lightly <laughs> <laughs> i like i like dark stuff i i i want more dark queer fiction mm -hmm. basically um and it's it's all different kinds of dark for me i like um playing around with different genres and subject matter but it, it's all very much rooted in this this um Part of it is the sense of alienation from the mainstream culture mm -hmm. and sort of um, that there are forces inside yourself um, in your own personality that you you um, are kind of left to reckon with on your own mm -hmm. and that makes them feel much more dangerous. So yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, 
I want more. <laughs> I, I always, I always um, tell people I want to read something upsetting and gay. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I like to write. <laughs> mm-hmm, for sure. I think we said earlier that I was like, this was my kind of escape. I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> it was super good to have right now. Um, yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I, if thank you, you so wrote it, I would me. read it. So I'm so oh, thank you excited so much. to see what happens next. Here's okay. your book, These Violent Delights. Everybody should check it out. And thank thank you you so so much. much. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you. You too.